The Sniper by Liam O'Flaherty The long twilight faded into night. Dublin lay enveloped in darkness, but for the dim light of the moon, casting a pale light over the streets and the dark waters of the Liffey. Around the besieged four courts, the heavy guns roared. Here and there around the city, machine guns and rifles broke the silence of the night on lonely farms. Republicans and free staters were waging civil war. On a rooftop near O'Connell Bridge, a Republican sniper lay watching. Beside him lay his rifle and over his shoulder was slung a pair of field glasses. His face was the face of a student, thin and serious, but his eyes had the cold gleam of a fanatic. They were deep and thoughtful, the eyes of a man who is used to looking at death. He was eating a sandwich hungrily. He had eaten nothing since morning. He had been too excited to eat. He finished the sandwich and taking a flask from his pocket, he took a short draught. Then he returned the flask to his pocket. He paused for a moment, considering whether he should light a fire to keep warm. It was dangerous. The light might be seen from a distance in the darkness and there were enemies watching. He decided to take the risk. He gathered some dead leaves and struck a match. Almost immediately, a bullet flattened itself against the parapet of the roof. The sniper put out the fire immediately. Then he swore softly and crawled away to the left. Cautiously, he raised himself and peered over the parapet. There was a flash and a bullet fizzed over his head. He dropped immediately. He had seen the flash. It came from the opposite side of the street. He rolled over the roof to a row of chimney pots in the rear and slowly drew himself up behind him until his eyes were level with the top of the parapet. There was nothing to be seen, just the dim outline of the opposite house top against the blue sky. His enemy was well concealed. Just then, an armored car came across the bridge and advanced slowly up the street. It stopped on the opposite side of the street, 50 yards ahead. The sniper could hear the dull panting of the engine. His heart beat faster. It was an enemy tank. He wanted to fire, but it was useless. His bullets would never pierce the steel that covered the grey monster. Then round the corner of the side street came an old woman, her head covered by a tattered shawl. She began to talk to the man in the turret of the tank. She was pointing to the roof where the sniper lay. An informer. The turret opened. A man's head and shoulders appeared looking towards the sniper. The sniper raised the rifle and fired. The head fell heavily on the turret wall. The woman darted towards the side street. The sniper fired again. The woman whirled around and fell with a shriek into the gutter. Suddenly, from the opposite roof, a shot rang out and the sniper dropped his rifle with a curse. The rifle clattered to the roof. The sniper thought the noise would wake the dead. He stooped to pick the rifle up. He couldn't lift it. His arm was dead. Christ, he murmured. I'm hit. Dropping flat onto the roof, he crawled back to the parapet. With his left hand, he felt the injured right arm. Blood was oozing out from the sleeve of his coat. There was no pain, just a deadened feeling as if the arm had been cut off. Quickly, he drew his knife from his pocket opened it by pressing it against the parapet and ripped open the sleeve. There was a small hole where the bullet had lodged in the bone. It must have fractured it. He bent the arm below the wound. It went easily. He ground his teeth to overcome the pain. Then taking out his first aid pocket, he ripped it open with his knife. He broke the neck of the iodine bottle and let the bitter liquid drip into the wound. A violent fit of pain swept through him. He placed the cotton pad over the wound and wrapped the bandage around it. He tied the ends with his teeth. Then he lay still against the parapet, and closing his eyes, he made an effort of will to overcome the pain. In the street beneath, all was still. The armored car had retired speedily over the bridge, with the machine gunner's head hanging lifeless over the turret. The woman's corpse lay still in the gutter. The sniper lay still for a long time, nursing his wounded arm and planning escape. Morning must not find him wounded on the roof.
the enemy on the opposite roof made escape impossible. He must kill that enemy, but he could not use his rifle. He had only a revolver to do it. Then he thought of a plan. Taking off his cap, he placed it over the muzzle of his rifle. Then he pushed the rifle slowly upward over the parapet until the cap was visible from the opposite side of the street. Almost immediately, there was a shot, and a bullet pierced the center of the cap. The sniper slanted the rifle. The cap slipped down into the street. Then, catching the rifle in the middle, the sniper dropped his left hand over the roof and let it hang lifelessly. After a few moments, he let the rifle drop to the street. Then, he sank to the roof, dragging his hand with him. Crawling quickly to the left, he peered up at the corner of the roof. His trick had succeeded. The other sniper, seeing the cap and the rifle fall, thought that he had killed his man. He was now standing before a row of chimney pots, looking across with his head clearly outlined against the western sky. The Republican sniper smiled and lifted his revolver above the edge of the parapet. The distance was about 50 yards, and he took a steady aim. Pressing his lips together, he took a deep breath and fired. He was almost deafened by the noise, and his arm shook with the recoil. Then, with the smoke cleared, he peered across and uttered a cry of joy. His enemy had been hit. He was swaying unsteadily over the parapet in his death agony. He struggled to keep his feet, but he was slowly falling forward, as if in a dream. The rifle fell from his grasp, hit the parapet, fell over, bounced off the pole of a barber's shop beneath, and then clattered on the pavement. Then, the dying man on the roof crumpled up and fell forward. The body turned over and over in space and hit the ground with a dull thud. Then it lay still. The sniper looked at his enemy falling and he shuddered. The lust of battle died in him. He was filled with remorse. The sweat stood out in beads on his forehead. Weakened by his wound and the long summer day of fasting and watching on the roof, he felt sick at the sight of the shattered body of his dead enemy. His teeth chattered. He began to mutter senselessly to himself, cursing the war, cursing himself, cursing everybody. He looked at the smoking revolver in his hand, and with an oath, he hurled it to the roof at his feet. The revolver went off with a loud bang, and the bullet whizzed past the sniper's head. He was frightened back to his senses by the shock. His nerves steadied. The cloud of fear scattered from his mind, and he laughed. Taking the flask from his pocket, he emptied it with a draught. He felt reckless and decided to leave the roof now and look for his company commander to report. Everywhere around was quiet. There was not much danger in going through the streets. He picked up his revolver and put it in his pocket. Then he crawled down through the skylight to the house underneath. When the sniper reached the street, he felt a sudden curiosity as to the identity of the enemy sniper whom he had killed. He decided that he was a good shot, whoever he was. He wondered if he knew him. Perhaps he had been in his own company for the split in the army. He decided to risk going over to have a look at him. He peered around the corner into O'Connell Street. In the upper part of the street there was heavy firing, but around here all was quiet. The sniper darted across the street. A machine gun tore up the ground around him with a hail of bullets, but he escaped. He threw himself face downward beside the corpse. The machine gun stopped. Then the sniper turned over the dead body and looked into his brother's face.